So since most of you have already had the dynamic analysis course, I'll just talk briefly about the, the different things so you can get the um, um, the, the different indicators from. Um, you can get what, what files get dropped, register changes, uh, what, what changes are made to the system, as well as any network traffic if the malware does that. Be aware of malware that uh, has a, a sleep in there between when it drops onto disk and when it uh, actually does network communication. But usually at that point, from a, from, from a real world perspective, if you get the malware to actually do something to the disk, um, even if it didn't do network communication, you know at that point that there, there's a bear there. You know, if, if something, this is bad. And from that point, you can dig into it further to figure out, is this doing your network analysis? Because don't always assume, if you don't see network traffic right away, that um, it's not doing any kind of, uh, doesn't have that capability. Um, yeah, I'm not going to bother doing the, the example there. Um, and this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the course. Static analysis, static code analysis, where we're, for the most part, not running it. Although when we get into debugging later in the course, we will actually be running the malware, hopefully just to a certain degree. But that's why we have VMs. Yeah, we already talked about the different stuff you can collect. Um, so one of the pros, uh, unlimited access to software capabilities and configuration. If you can get through you know, the hacker and the obfuscation techniques, and also, this is something that, that I'm starting to see more and more, if the malware isn't downloading its capabilities over the network. Uh, there, there are malware that remote access tools, rats, that what you get on initial infection is just enough for the rat to start up and start beginning and looking for commands. And one of the commands that it can get is, hey, here's a DLL or, or a blob of data, not necessarily in DLL format, load it into memory, execute that as executable code. And you get that only when you actually have it on a live network and it's connected to an actual controller and the actor is pushing down that data. Um, having said that, if you're working with somebody who's doing the packet capture and has that data, and then you can pull those blobs out of memory, you can load those up in an item and analyze them and find out what they're doing. And uh, sometimes they won't be um, obfuscated as well as the initial malware, and you get some good information from, from what those modules are doing. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely requires deeper knowledge than just, just running it, um, or I shouldn't say just running it, than running it and collecting the information from a, a dynamic analysis. This is simply. So here's a question. We're going to be using IDA as a disassembler. Does anybody remember what I said two weeks ago? The two different types of, of disassembling are and what type IDA uses in terms of how does it, how does it go through and um, identify this is the instruction, um, this is the next instruction, this is the next instruction. Here are the, the different blocks. Drew? One of them linear. Linear, um, linear, linear, linear sweep, sweep, linear sweep. Is one of them. And what is what does that do? Goes in order. Order of the execution. Goes down and then follows execution. Linear sweep follows the execution. <laughs> I think you meant more the, the memory, right? It follows the file or the memory just from top to bottom. Really yeah, linear sweep just reads 
the memory sequentially, starting at um, starting at the top or the low memory and working its way down. It it just reads okay. This is in and it says okay. This is an instruction. Um, this is how many bytes long that instruction is. And I go to the end of that, and there's my next instruction. This is how many bytes long that instruction is. Goes to the next one and, and keeps going through. Um, and that can be okay. A lot of a lot of tools will use that because it's really simple. Um, but if you have data interspersed with your code, it can throw off the disassembly. Is there um, an alignment issue with, uh, can, can you assume that a sort of non-sneaky binary uh, starts with predictable alignment at, at low memory? I, mean, I would think that you'd start at like whatever entry points you can discern from the, from the header mm -hmm. and then just go linearly from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one way to do it, starting at the entry point, working your way down from there. But if there is data interspersed, then you're going to, that's going to trip that up. The other way to do it is re recursive traversal, where it, the disassembler actually looks at the instruction, and if it's a call, or it's a conditional jump, or, or a non-conditional jump, it will actually um, traverse down that um, and, and basically form a tree. And if it hits something that it's already analyzed, it stops stops at that node in the tree um, and, and progresses through the rest of it. And by doing that, it um, follows through um, and can get around data that's interspersed with the actual actual executable code. Um, that is what IDA uses. It's a little more complex, but it tends to be better at identifying your functions at your executable code. Having said that, it's not perfect, and and especially if you start doing malware analysis on things that are um, obfuscated in some way, then um, it it can have trouble. But it IDA will do that kind of first go for you, and you can go in and say, oh, no, the actual um, boundary for this function is, is actually up a little, um, and it went a little too far, because this other piece down here is a whole separate function. And Ida provides a, a means for the analyst to actually uh, make that change to the disassembly view into the Ida database. So we'll see.